right, uh, go ahead and open up your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 11. So, uh, last week was the last first principle study, the church study. And so today I just want to hit on uh, how to mature in Christ. So, what do we do to help people mature in Christ? And how do we know if we are maturing in Christ? So, we're going to start off by looking at what uh, Isaiah prophesied the church would look like in Isaiah chapter 11. Uh, you see the coming of Jesus prophesied and the coming of the church or the kingdom here. In verse 1, it says, A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots a branch will bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the Spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the Spirit of counsel and of might, the Spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his bow, with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. Uh, just the writings of Isaiah through the Holy Spirit, the way he describes our Lord is just super encouraging. And we did see at his baptism the Holy Spirit come down like a dove and lay on him, and it shows all the different aspects of the Spirit here, you know, counsel and might, wisdom, knowledge, understanding, uh, and he delights in the fear of the Lord. Like, it's just awesome. Um, verse 6 here, he describes us. Verse 6 says, the wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. So remember, in order to be in the kingdom, you must be like a, a little child, right? And so as a child, here he says, a child leads people in this new kingdom. Verse 7, the cow will feed with the bear, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the crow's den, and the young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the water covers the sea. In that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the people. The nations will rally to him, and his resting place will be glorious. And for a lot of people, they're like, look at that, they go, this is, this is stupid. Well, you know, if you go, what if, this makes no sense. The wolf, the lamb, the leopard, the goat. Like, this just doesn't make sense to people. But in the kingdom, I mean, think about it. I know for a fact that most of you, if I was not your brother, and you were not in the kingdom, you would not like me. Because <laughs> I would take advantage of you, I would try to get over on you, I would try to deceive you, I would see what I could get from you, because I'm a viper in the world. And I probably wouldn't like you. <laughs> we come from all different backgrounds. Really what we represent is what was in the ark. All the animals that should have killed each other, but God protected them. And that's how he treats us in the kingdom. He protects us. He helps us to get along. Yeah. Uh, and a child leads us. And we have an amazing uh, uh, Lord. He says that uh, from the stump of Jesse will come this shoot. And remember, Jesse was not the king. The king was his son. And so why, why not the stump of David? Well, because Jesus didn't come from royalty. He came from poverty. And that's Jesse. And so the shoot rises up from poverty. And then he says that uh, in verse 10, in that day the root of Jesse will stand as a banner. Back then, uh, a banner re, uh, serves to announce something significant is happening. And so something amazing is happening where all nations come together and we get along. 
Like that is pretty significant. Yeah. Um, he, uh, he says here in verse 1 that a branch will bear fruit. Let's look at John 15 as Jesus explains this branch here for us. It's interesting, in, in my version, there's a capital B for branch. A branch will bear fruit. John 15, verse 1. He says, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Now, in the Greek, if you look it up, and I know some of you will, it's singular. It's branch. I am the vine. You are the branch. But he's speaking to many people, and so obviously it's translated branches. But, you know, the church isn't uh, the building. It's the people, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so we are the church. We are the branch. And the branch bears fruit, Isaiah says. So this is what Jesus is talking about, that we are the branch that Isaiah spoke about. I am the vine, Jesus says. And remember, uh, uh, John the Baptist says, the axe is already at the root. And if you guys don't repent, God is going to cut it down. And he's talking to the Pharisees. And did he not cut it down? Yeah. He did. And so from this root, from the history, from the Old Testament history, he cuts it down, and then this vine comes out, this uh, vine, which is Jesus, and we are the branch to bear fruit. Now, some of the things uh, I'd like you to write down here in verse 2 it says, He cuts off every branch of me that bears no fruit. Uh, the term cuts off in Greek is aero, A I R O. Um, and in most of the translations, uh, if you look at where aero is at in the Bible, uh, like for example in John 5 8, then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. Pick up is arrow. And so if you were to interview someone who had a uh, grape vineyard, and there was a branch that wasn't bearing fruit, and it was at the bottom, so it can't get any sunlight, he would pick it up, dust it off, give it some water, and then it would bear fruit. And I believe that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying that if you bear no fruit, God picks you up, brushes you off, and helps you to be fruitful. He says, well, every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, so it'll be even more fruitful. And so you go out, you make disciples, God then prunes you, yeah. so you can be even more fruitful. Yeah. Um, and so Jesus wants his church, his branch, to bear fruit. In uh, Luke chapter 8, Jesus describes the process of building a church that is fruitful. You guys with me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. In verse 11, Luke 8, 11 says, This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are those uh, are the ones who hear, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts, so that they may not believe and be saved. Those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a, a while, but in time of testing, they fall away. The seed that fell among the thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. The seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering produce a crop. Okay, so as a church in this room, we are one of these four soils. At different times in our walk with God, we are going to be one of these four soils. Uh, we're going to be like the path, the heart is like a path. This 
people step on us, people hurt us. That's what a path, well, that's why there's a path that people step on us. That becomes a path, right? And so you feel stepped on, you feel hurt, and so your heart gets hard. And so then anything that's spiritual that is trying to talk to you, the devil comes and takes it away. Uh, the other one is uh, the rocky ground. And so uh, it's shallow. And so you have, when you get baptized, you come into the kingdom and you have all this baggage in your life, right? You, you, uh, you don't get like a, a new memory. You still remember all the things and you still have the pains. You still have the, the character that can get you angry like that. Like that doesn't go away. You got to deal with those things. You got to work through those things. And so you got to bring the rocks up to the, up to the surface and deal with them. Um, and so you can be fruitful. If not, you just stay shallow. And you can tell people have uh, rocks because they come late, they leave early, they, you know, how are you doing? Great. How was your quiet time? Awesome. <laughs> you know, how about them? Uh, Buffalo Bills. As far as you can get with them, right? There's no, there's no uh, uh, meat in, in the conversations there. And we got to help them. And then there's those uh, that are planted by the thorns. And so they have worries, the riches of pleasure. Um, and they're choked. And they don't mature. And so all these things are going to be us at some point. Mm -hmm. It might be some of you right now. we got to deal with these things. And so uh, turn over. Oh, actually, let's, let's look through the good soil here. Mm -hmm. Good soil. Come on, brother. So it starts off with a noble and good heart. So does anyone remember any scripture that has the word noble in it? The Bereans. The Bereans have a noble character. What do they do? Yeah, they eagerly examine the scriptures every day. And so a noble and good heart usually examines the scriptures every day. It says, when they hear the word, they retain it. They retain it. And so if you uh, just Google, how do I retain knowledge? There's a lot of studies. Has anyone ever studied that out? I saw Jalisa nod her head. What, what's the... One like the biggest way that you can retain knowledge. Right. Writing down is thirty percent, but there's one that's ninety-five percent. Teaching. Teaching it, that's right. And so, if you take what you've learned in your quiet time and you teach it, ninety-five percent of that you'll retain. Yeah. And so, how do you retain by teaching? Yeah. Right. And this helps you mature. And the last one there is uh, persevering. Just don't give up. Don't give up. If you don't give up, you will produce a crop. This is a sign of maturing, producing a crop. And so a crop is not one baptism. Like, this is almost a crop right here. Like this, right in this whole room. <coughs> so our goal should be in our lifetime to produce a crop. People that have gone from darkness into light. And the way you do that is by having a noble and good heart, retaining what you hear by teaching others and not giving up. Amen? Amen. Amen. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Starting at verse 11, it says, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity of the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then... We will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people 
in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. <coughs> and so, here it describes the church and how to mature the church. And so, it says that Jesus chose your Bible talk leader. That's what it says. Jesus chose your Bible talk leader. Right? The shepherd. So that Jesus chose them. What for? To equip God's people for works of service so that we can become mature as we all do our part. Um, it says that uh, by every supporting ligament, ligament, it's uh, a ligament is where we get the word reliable, not dependent. Dependent is not the same thing. Like you think of a pendant, it's like it hangs over your neck and it just, it doesn't do anything to help the neck. The neck helps the pendant. But reliable is a ligament where it works together with the rest of the body. So each part does the work. And so you don't want to be dependent. You want to be reliable. The ligament, as each part does its work. Hebrews chapter 5. It's important that we speak the truth in love. Yep. Yeah. You know, some people go, well, it's the truth. Why can't I just tell you the truth? Well, you forgot the in love part. Ah. It's, it's, is it the most loving thing you can do right now? If not, just be quiet. No reason to say anything. But if it's in love, then we help each other. We build each other up. Hebrews chapter 5. Verse 11, it says, we have much to say about this, but it is hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. And so, yes, we need each other. Uh, God puts people in our lives to help us, but we also need to train ourselves to distinguish good from evil. Uh, and so, when you're stuck, if your first call is to me, it's not to God, just put the phone down, talk to God, Amen. ask him for wisdom, look in the scriptures. And then call me or whoever. You know what I'm saying? But yeah. your first, your first point of contact needs to be God, the Holy yeah. Spirit, and the Scriptures. Teaching yourself to distinguish good from evil using the Scriptures. Let's keep reading here. Hebrews six, verse one. Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death. And of faith in God, instructions about cleansing rites, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment, and God permitting, we will do so. It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the power of the coming age, and who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance. To their loss, they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. Let's stop there for a second. So this isn't really part of the study, but just so you understand what he's saying here. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of us, we want to reach out to those who have fallen away and try to bring them back. You can love them, and you can serve them and love them in different ways, but it's impossible for you to bring them back. Uh, just think of the prodigal son. It says when he came to his senses, he came back to God. <laughs> and so we just have to pray that they come back to their senses. That God allows them to be humbled, but not guilty. Okay. And then that they come back uh, to God. All right, verse 7. Land that drinks in the rain, often falling on it, um, 
and that produces a crop useful to those for whom it is farmed receives the blessing of God. But land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and is in danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burnt. Isn't that very familiar? This is just like what we read in Luke. It's talking about producing a crop. And if you, uh, if your land, if your heart is thorns and thistles, just a bunch of worries and deceitfulness of wealth, it chokes you out, you're in danger. Verse 9. Even though we speak like this, dear friends, we are convinced of better things in your case. The things that have to do with salvation. It's important that you know the scripture. Because what we're about to read has to do with what? Your salvation. Verse 10. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. We want each of you to show the same diligence to the very end so that what you hope for may be fully realized. We do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. And so this is our salvation. Don't be lazy. Don't get into, uh, you know, a check the box kind of life where, okay, then we check. D-time check, Sunday check, but we are to help each other, to really have that in our hearts, to build up the church where we all work together to bring unity. And so the challenge is for us to grow in maturity ourselves and then to teach others to grow into maturity. So practically, I've got some practicals here from what we just read. Okay, so write down these practicals. First, start with your own heart. See where you're at. Which one are you at? Is your heart hard? Is it got rocks? Is it got thorns? Or with a good and noble heart, are you eagerly examining the scriptures every day, persevering uh, and teaching others? If you're not teaching others, then you're not in that one soil. you got to figure out where you're at and deal with it and get some help. Then you want to communicate, communicate clearly that we are the branch that produces fruit, Isaiah 11. As a church, that is who we are. We are the branch that produces fruit. And that Jesus puts teachers in our life to help us to mature and to be able to produce fruit. We want to make sure that we speak the truth in love. That's number four. Speak the truth in love. Uh, that Jesus puts teachers in our life. So start with your own heart, communicate clearly, um, and that Jesus puts people in our lives. In other words, if you are a spiritual mentor, a disciple, a discipler of someone, then God put you in that person's life to teach them, to bring them to mature. Because no one comes out of the waters of baptism knowing how to produce a crop, right? And so as you learn, you're going to teach them because that's how you retain it. By what you learn, you retain it by teaching them. See how that works? Just picture um, a grapevine, and you've got the clusters of grapes. Each one of those clusters is like a Bible tongue, and you're all together, right? One of the grapes doesn't run off and go with another cluster. No, you're together. You're a family, and and you work together. That's that's the intention. The vine, the Holy Spirit works through that. Uh, you know, you don't have any independent little grapes jumping from vine to vine, right? You work together. Um, okay, then you need to understand the hearts of the disciples in your life. Figure out if their heart is hard with rocks, with thorns, noble or good. If if they aren't in the situation where they can bear fruit, if they need help, you do not want to rebuke them and be hard on them. No, 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 you want to do what God does. You want to lift them up. Yeah. yeah. You want to lift them up, carry them, brush them off, water <coughs> them, go to their place and have a quiet time with them, go to their work, take them to lunch, 
you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, this is what we do. This is a family. We take care of each other. Um, I already said it all. Mm -hmm. Lift them up, clean them off, help them have a noble and good heart, help them to eagerly examine the scriptures every day. You should be asking them, how are their quiet times? Help them. And then help them to retain it by challenging them to teach it to other people. Uh, you know, I had the pleasure of studying the Bible with Devin. Got to baptize him. And uh, and now he's writing a lesson. I challenged him to write a lesson. Yeah. So maybe not next Wednesday, but the following Wednesday, coming up soon, he's going yeah. to preach. Yeah. 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 So, you can do that. You can have someone in your Bible talk lead the next lesson. Uh, teach them to teach. Let's close out in Hebrews chapter 3. Because they're not going to retain it if you don't help them to teach it. Hebrews what? Chapter 3. This is the last practical. Verse 12. It says, see to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. <coughs> so, we believe in our church in discipling. All the one another scriptures back up why with what we believe. Yeah. It is uh, not an option that we disciple those uh, in our life. Um, and we try to put it in our calendar. You should have it in your calendar every week at this time. We're going to get together and we're going to do some uh, spiritual stuff, whether it's uh, confession, prayer, Bible study, counseling, whatever it is, you're going to get together and go, okay, here's Jesus, here's you. What can we change this week to make you more like Jesus? That's, that's, that's basically disciple. Here's Jesus, here's you, what can we do different this week? And watch them grow. Watch them grow. Has uh, not Devin and Nicole grown? Yeah. 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 Minutes. Why? Disciple. It's disciple. Come on. It's getting in, in, in their life. I care about them. They know I care about yeah. them. And you know what? Yeah. It's not once a week. How often do we talk? Multiple times a day. Multiple times a day. <laughs> nice. This is, this is what I want to do. I want to be an example to you guys. It should not be a checklist once a week we get together. So we studied, baptized him, now discipling. And I'm going to help him mature into Christ. This has to be all of our hearts. That no matter what time, uh, we have an open door policy. That we are, we are there for them. Right? And I know he would do that for me. If I asked him for anything, he would do it. Because we're bonded. We're bonded that way. And this needs to be, that we should feel like that to the people in our lives. That we're that close. Daily encouragement needs to be added into your convictions. The conviction of once a week, solid. But now let's bring it to daily. Yeah. Daily encouragement. Why? Because it only takes one day for your heart to be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. No. And in the passage before that, in Ephesians, it says that uh, then we won't be tossed back and forth and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people. It doesn't say Satan. It says of people in their deceitful schemes. See, there are people that are going to try to blow you here and there by different teachings. Yeah. Yeah. And you have to understand that about yourself and about the people that God puts in your life. And you need to be that support for them. Help them. Help them mature. Help them understand what the scriptures say so they can be solid. Their foundation is on the rock, on the scriptures, on the love that God puts in us through his Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. All right. That is the lesson. We have half an hour. Okay, yeah, you can clap.